Well, I see it's 1.30. So I'd like to uh, uh, thank all of you uh, for joining, tuning in to this wonderful program we've got. Uh, I know I'm looking forward to this as well, uh, Raptors of the, of the River Valley. Um, my name is Dan Peterson. I'm a park ranger at St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. Uh, and just um, just kind of chatting a little bit about the, the weather and all. But um, just uh, maybe we've got some uh, little housekeeping uh, notes here to kind of start off first is um, on the right side of your screen, uh, you'll see a few chat options uh, just to keep things simple. Uh, the sessions chat is where we'd like to uh, have you share your questions and comments. Uh, please avoid using the Q&A chat space and the event chat space uh, as we won't see any, any of your comments. Uh, this session is being recorded uh, and will be made permanently available on the Wild Rivers Conservancy YouTube account. Uh, during this session, there will be an opportunity for you to ask a question or participate by sharing your, your video or audio. Um, if you don't want to want to be recorded, uh, please, we just you know, don't ask you to share the, your video. You can just put your questions right into the chat. Um, so without uh, uh, without any, uh, uh, at least getting all those, all those housekeeping uh, bits and pieces out of the way, I'd like for all of you uh, to meet our presenter here today, uh, Abby, with uh, she's going to be presenting uh, Raptors of the River Valley. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks for having me. If you tuned in this morning, you see I'm in a different location. Hopefully our technical difficulties have been fixed and I've already made plans to re-record the session. So if your class would really like to rewatch it without some of those interruptions, um, it will be up with the rest of the YouTube videos as well. Um, so I'm from Carpenter Nature Center. We have two campuses in the River Valley, one in Hastings, Minnesota, right before the confluence of the St. Croix and the Mississippi, and then another one in Hudson, Wisconsin, on the Wisconsin side. So we have a really unique position to see both states that border um, the amazing St. Croix River. As Dan was saying, right now we're seeing a lot of our raptors that go vacation elsewhere in the winter, um, come back. Some of those are turkey vultures, um, some falcons and hawks and other things like that. At Carpenter Nature Center here, we have um, several species of raptors that are animal ambassadors. So they get to meet cool students like you and showcase just how amazing raptors are. So we're gonna meet a few of them today. One of them was actually out on another program. So you might see somebody walk by me with a crate here and they're gonna bring in our third guest sometime during our session here. So when we're talking about a raptor, we better figure out what a raptor even is. So all raptors are birds, but not all birds are raptors. So when you think about a raptor, they all need three things. The first are curved hooked beak. That's because the, all they're going to eat is meat. So they need that curved beak to be able to shred their food and get it into small enough bits to swallow. The second one are really long, sharp talons to catch that prey and meat that they're gonna eat. And the third is really good eyesight. That's not something we can necessarily see from the outside, um, but they have all have amazing eyesight. There are birds that only eat meat that aren't raptors. One that I like to think of as a penguin. So penguins only eat fish, right? Um, but when you think about a penguin and an eagle, they look quite different. So their penguins are not a raptor. I brought some pieces to show you what I mean when we're talking about those talons. So this first thing here is a foot from a turkey. So you can see the turkey does have these small talons here, which are meant for rooting around in the soil and the dirt to eat insects. Um, and they will have a longer one meant for protecting themselves as well. Um, but they have these long toes with these decent talons. Now these are not a raptor, but if you look at this foot, although much smaller, the talons are ginormous. Look at how big, curved, and long those talons are. If you're guessing what kind of bird this foot came from, if you immediately thought owl, you would be right. We know it's an owl because the feathers go all the way down to the tippy toes. Hopefully we will get to see some owl feet on a real owl here in a little bit. 
but that's one of the things that all doctors need. So when I pull out my guests here, we're going to double check to make sure they have all three of those things, make sure I'm not pulling out any tricks, and then we'll get to learn about each one. So my birds are just off the screen here, so I'll have to leave the screen for just a moment while I grab them, and then I'll come back. So hold on one moment while I grab our first guest. Okay, I'm just going to find a comfortable position here so that you can see him all right. So this is a peregrine falcon. Right away, I know he's a falcon because he has these stripes here on his cheeks. Those are called malar stripes, and they actually serve a pretty important purpose. So some birds, like hawks and eagles, kind of have these moody eyebrows like this. That acts like a visor, like when we wear a hat, to keep the sun out of their eyes when they're soaring up in the sky. Our falcon ear has these bright, really exposed eyes, which make him super cute, but also leave his eyes open to the sun. These malar stripes here help him block the sun, similar to an athlete, like a football player or a baseball player, wearing eye black. It helps cut down the glare that reaches his eyes. So most falcons are going to have those malar stripes there, so that's usually a pretty good giveaway. Now, he's a peregrine falcon, which are found here in the River Valley. All of the birds, oh, <laughs> so that behavior is called a rouse and generally means they're pretty comfortable in the situation that they're in. Um, so it's a nice treat to see. Um, they are found here in the River Valley and actually all of our guests today are native species. So when we talk about a native species, um, they've adapted to live here. So I always like to say like the animal superpowers that that animal has are designed to help them live, thrive and survive here in our area. If we go to a different area of the state or the country or the world, it's going to be slightly different. But peregrines here love the river valley. They love to nest on big cliffs. So we see those along the north shore of Minnesota, but especially here in the river valley too. We have nice beautiful bluffs with rocky faces and they even um, adapt to human spaces really well. Down here in Hastings, they nest on the bridge that connects Minnesota and Wisconsin near Prescott. And up farther in the River Valley, they also nest on um, <laughs> towers uh, at the power plants, at the King plant in Bayport. So you can find them all over. Now, peregrines are a really good success story for the River Valley. A long time ago, um, they were almost extinct. We actually have a fancy word called extirpated, which means they were extinct in a certain region. So we found zero peregrines east of the Mississippi for many years. That's because humans were using a chemical called DDT. Okay, DDT, we were spraying it on our cornfields and agricultural fields. And although it didn't hurt our full-grown mature birds, it was affecting the females or the moms' ability to lay eggs. Their eggshells were so thin that when they went to incubate their babies, they were actually cracking the eggshells. So no new babies were born for quite a while. That also happened with eagles. Peregrines sometimes don't get the same um, recognition for this story as eagles do. But here, we were a big part in Minnesota and Wisconsin, a big part of bringing peregrines back. So we banned the chemical DDT. And then conservationists here in our area helped rehabilitate birds, install breeding programs, and bring them back from near extinction. Now these birds have amazing superpowers. So I know he's a raptor, looking at him, he has these talons on his feet, which is why I'm wearing this glove. Um, his talons are very sharp, meant for capturing prey, especially other birds. He's got a very nice curved hooked beak, if he will look for you. <laughs> and he has amazing eyesight, although that's kind of hard to see on screen. Peregrines have awesome superpowers. They are, I hope he's going to rouse for you again. You guys are getting quite the, the happy peregrine today. <laughs> peregrines are actually the fastest animal on the planet. So sometimes people will say, well, Miss Abby, I was always taught it was um, 
Hold on, our other guest is coming. <laughs> oh, hold on one moment. <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> hi I don't know how many classrooms watching. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your patience. That guest was um, on double duty today. He's being an awesome ambassador, so he just came from another program. Um, but our peregrine here has a couple superpowers. So the first is being the fastest animal on the planet. So sometimes people will say cheetahs, right? So I always learned as a kid, cheetahs went 100 miles an hour. They actually don't even go that. They go more about 70 miles an hour. Our peregrine friends, when they are diving in what we call a stoop after some prey, they can clock in at over 200 miles an hour. The average is usually 232 is what um, scientists say, but as our technology has gotten better at measuring their speed, we have clocked them going whoo, even faster. When you're looking at him spreading out his wings, you can see they're nice and sleek and long. That's gonna help him be super fast. When he's flying that fast, he's not flapping his wings. He actually tucks in his wings, tucks in his feet, and he's diving like a little silver bullet through the air. Now he's gonna do that because his favorite food are other birds. Some raptors eat mice and things that scurry on the ground. Our peregrine here loves to eat other flying things. You gotta be pretty fast and pretty agile to catch those other flying birds. So what they're gonna do is dive in a stoop ball up their little feet and they'll actually punch the birds out of the air and swoop and pick them up before they even hit the ground. He can also eat as he's flying, which is pretty talented. So those long um, toes have a lot of dexterity and movement. So he can eat while he's flying, which to me is the true version of fast food. Now, if you think about us, we aren't designed to go very fast. Although we have cars and trains and planes to help us go fast, but if we were just to go that fast on our own, it'd be really hard to breathe. So I'm gonna give you some homework, but it's gonna be the best homework you've ever had, okay? When you, the next time you're in a car with whoever's driving, ask them if you can roll down the window and stick your head out. If you're going pretty fast, especially like 45 to 65 miles an hour, it gets hard to breathe. Our nostrils are not designed to take in air when it's going that fast. It just goes right over our nose. Our peregrine here, had to have a special adaptation to be able to breathe when he's flying that fast. I'm gonna see if he'll get a little closer to the camera so you can see. What you're looking for is in his nostril. So in his nostril, you can see it's the hole of the nostril and there's a little peg in the middle. Let's see if I'll show you one more time. So that little peg is actually capturing air and turning it in a spiral and slowing it down. That way he can take in the air into his lungs instead of it just zooming past his nostril. We call this a tubercle. And this is actually a design that humans use as well. If you think about what a plane looks like, an airplane, underneath the wing of the plane, there's this special thing that's a circle with a peg in the middle. That's actually doing the same thing for the plane that his nostril is doing for him, slowing down the air so that the engine can take in the oxygen it needs for combustion and to keep us afloat. Now our peregrine also has some cool coloring. I always kind of um, associate it with a shark. So sharks have a dark top and a light bottom, just like our peregrine does. And it's gonna help them camouflage us really similar to our peregrine. Our peregrine, the light bottom, if prey looks up, it's gonna help hide him in the light coming down. If he's below prey and they look down, his dark top helps him hide in that way too. If it's a female sitting on a nest, the duck helps them blend in. So his coloring, even though he looks kind of stark outside of nature in my office here, is actually really helping him blend in. Now there's one cool thing that I want us to notice about him when we look at our other birds. So he has these really open eyes, that's why he has those malar stripes, but it actually gives us a clue to um, his evolution as a species. So he's actually more closely related to a parrot than he is to something like a red-tailed hawk. 
And you can kind of see that in his face and the different facial structure. There's actually a picture of an eagle here behind me and you can see they have those bigger eyebrows like that. Um, our peregrine has a much more open face similar to a parrot. <laughs> if you have any questions, don't be afraid to put them in the chat. Um, these birds too are saying how well they adapted to life in the city. Um, one of their favorite things to eat are pigeons. Pigeons are actually very talented flyers and can fly at almost 40 miles an hour in a straight line. So they give peregrines a run for their money, but they have adapted to live there because there's lots of pigeons to eat. So it's kind of like a free buffet every day. And our skyscrapers actually make almost perfect cliffs, which is pretty cool. I think that's going to be it for our peregrine. I'll see if I can get him just a bit closer so that you can see. He, he likes to look at me when we do presentations, so he, he might be looking at me instead. There you go. <laughs> so he's pretty small for a peregrine as well, if you see them out in the wild. I and mean, this is true for a lot of raptor species. The ladies are actually bigger than the boys. So not only is he a boy, but he's also a little small. So when you see them in the wild, uh, they might be a little bit bigger than this guy here. All right, I'm just gonna step off and put him back and grab our next guest, but I'll be right with you. All right, I have our next guest here. I'll see if I can back up a little bit so you can see him. So he is a red, whoop. <laughs> I'm gonna make all the papers on my desk go. <laughs> so he is a red tailed hawk. So right away, he's got more of that, um, more eyebrow forward face like we were talking about with eagles and hawks compared to our falcon. If I turn him around here, you can see the tail where he gets his name. So scientists have a lot of plants and animals and things to name. So a lot of times um, they name them for how they look. Other birds are a good example, like a red-winged blackbird is a blackbird with red wings. So our hawk here, hawk with a red tail. It also helps me remember what each bird is. So I like when they have easy names like that. <laughs> our red-tailed hawks are really common here in our area. A lot of times we call them highway hawks because you may see them when you're driving down the road perched on the side of the road. They like to hang out there because they're going to use their amazing vision to look for all those critters in the tall grass. So that's one way that they use that awesome vision. Now these birds have much different wings compared to our peregrine that we saw earlier. So his wings are going to be big and broad like a big fan and that's going to help him soar in strong winds instead of doing that dive. Although they do dive at a very impressive speed. Red-tailed hawks like this can dive in the stoop at 120 miles an hour. So they're no slow animal, but the peregrines still got them, still got them beat. So they're going to do a lot of soaring. And they like open areas like prairies and our agricultural fields here. So we do see a lot of hawks. Now he also has different Feet. So when you're looking at his feet, he's hanging out this one just a little weird here. His feet are nice and chunky. Okay, He, instead of catching birds from the air, he sacrificed some of that dexterity for more strength and cushion. So he's going to perch up on that telephone pole and swoop down and land on his prey on the ground. So he has to have a little bit more structure to his foot to compensate for landing on the ground like that. 
He does have the curved hook beak still compared to our peregrine. Oh, if you can see it, there you go. Um, and his coloring can be slightly different than some of the hawks you might see here. This hawk is originally from Nebraska, so he's slightly darker in his keel and chest area here. Um, a lot of our hawks are a little bit more white. Um, and his red tail actually has something pretty interesting. So our hawks keep their red band that you can see, or the big bland band you can see here, but they tend to lose these little tick marks right here as they get older. In Nebraska, those hawks keep those tick marks as they get old. So although for our birds here, he's got the tail of a juvenile. He's actually our oldest um, bird ambassador here at the Nature Center. He's actually in his 20s, believe it or not. So he looks pretty good for being quite the old man. Birds in the wild tend to not live that long. Um, it's pretty hard out there to have to catch all your food, um, survive all the weather, especially a spring like this spring. Um, or fall and winter. So they tend to live, you know, 10 to 15 years is a really, really good life. Um, but birds in captivity can live a really long time. We, um, our friends at the Raptor Center have had birds that live into their late 40s. So it's definitely um, something that we can do. He's gonna go to the bathroom for us. <laughs> Interesting fact about birds, they can poop up to every 10 minutes. It helps um, keep them light. So you're gonna get rid of any extra baggage that they don't need. Our hawks here are actually really light. So although he looks pretty big, this bird weighs roughly two pounds. Fluctuates a little bit during the year, a little heavier in the winter, a little lighter in the summer. So he's actually not very heavy, although that doesn't mean that, you know, it's not hard to be a good branch, <laughs> but he's not, um, not heavy. Even when you think of a huge full grown eagle, they're only about eight to 12 pounds. So they're very light as well. And that's how birds can fly. Even if I grew a full body full of feathers and wings appropriate for my body size, I still wouldn't be able to fly very well. Humans are just really heavy and really dense. In between him and our next guest, I have some bird bones to show you just how thin they really are. Now our hawk here is gonna eat a wide range of things. Red tailed hawks can be found from Southern Canada, the entire United States and down into Mexico. Having a territory that big and a range that big means that they're pretty adaptable. So here our hawks like to eat mostly cute and fuzzy things like mice, voles, rabbits, and stuff like that. Um, but in more desert environments like the Southwest, they'll also eat lizards and snakes um, and pretty much anything they can catch. <laughs> so they are pretty adaptable, which is one of their awesome talents. There we go. It's a little bit out of focus. <laughs> he's pretty cool so you'll see too just one thing that i like to point out our birds here are non-releasable birds um they were all wild at some point and were injured and rehabbed and then deemed non-releasable so that means we can never let them go back out to the wild um, for their safety so this bird you'll notice he's on equipment like this same with our other birds it's really similar to like having your dog on a leash. It's for his safety so he doesn't run into things um, and our safety as well. So this bird is with us because he actually ran into the side of the semi truck. So he was hanging out on the side of the highway, just like we had said um, these birds like to do. And he saw a tasty mouse across the, the street, didn't look both ways before he crossed and he ran head first into the side of the semi trailer. Obviously the semi-trailer one, um, he doesn't wear a helmet either, but a kind driver behind uh, picked him up, brought him to a rehab where they fixed him up, but deemed him non-releasable <laughs> due to a brain injury. And he's also blind in the eye that's closest to me. So all of those things meant that he was better suited being an animal ambassador instead of being released back to the wild, which is a pretty cool way to have a second chance in your life. I don't know if you heard him do his little peep. <laughs> That's his way of telling me he's hungry. <laughs> Just give you a few more minutes to admire him because he's so handsome. And then I'm gonna trade him out so we can look at some bones and then meet another guest. All right, I'll be right back.
All right, thank you for being patient with me. So I brought two bones to show you today. This bone is from a mammal. It's a little bit hard to see, I think. If you look at the end is what I'm trying to get it to focus on. It might not. Well, maybe it won't. Well, you can see just how thick this bone is here around the edge. This is a bone from a mammal and would look similar to ours. So they have really thick edge here. I have part of a wing from an eagle and I want us to see just how thin the edge of the bone is here compared to ours. Oh, sorry, my camera is not uh, wanting to focus on the bone here. Well, might not be able to see it. But I kind of see it. It's super, super thin in the end. And this bone is really light. So that's one way that birds save weight to be able to fly like that. It's just having these super light bones. Now there is kind of this um, spider webbing structure in there is what it looks like to me, spider webs. And that's going to give them um, strength, even though they're really thin. So they do have some strength to them still, but a little bit more fragile than our human bones. Ours have to support a lot more weight <laughs> than a bird does. Okay, I have one more guest. I promised you in the beginning that you might see an owl. So I'm actually going to grab one of our owl species here. I want you in your head to think about what an owl looks like. So it still needs all three traits of a raptor, but owls look a little bit different than both our peregrine and our hawk that we've seen so far. So in your head while I'm um, getting her out, see if you can picture what an owl looks like and how that compares to when you see her. They're not used to me sitting down when we present, so it's a little bit of an odd position for them. Um, so this is our barred owl. Let's see if I can get her to turn around for you. <laughs> so she's one of many species that we have. We actually have a surprising number of species of owls in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Not all are found in the River Valley, but these definitely are. I just heard a wild one hooting um, just this week in one of our ravines here at Carpenter Nature Center. So she is a barred owl. She gets her name from these kind of vertical bar feathers on her belly. Sometimes people confuse her with a barn owl, like where we keep our horses and cows, um, but they're actually a different. They have a super white face and this pretty buffy tan body. So two different kinds, barred and barn. Um, owls, we obviously don't see them very much because they're nocturnal. Um, but if you hear them, you can tell what species of owl it is based on the call that you hear. Each one is going to have a different call. These barred owls like this have a pretty funny one. Uh, most people, when you put it into human words to help us remember, or English words, it's who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Um, this, uh, she's been making that call quite a bit um, recently. Other owls have different calls. So great horned owls are the typical owl call we think of when we picture one in our head. Um, and we even have tiny little sawit owls here in the River Valley, and their call to me sounds like a dump truck backing up. It's a little bit like doot, doot, doot. It's kind of funny. Owls to me are one of the raptors that have the craziest superpowers. So when you look at an owl's face, their face is nice and round, and that is actually to help them hear. So when you look at our ear, we kind of have this flabby stuff on the sides. That's to help us hear. It helps us pick up sound and funnel it into our ear, to our eardrums. Owls don't have that. Their ears are pretty big holes in the side of their head um, and they're lopsided. So one's down here and one's up here. And that way when they do their owl head thing, 
<laughs> it helps them locate their food. Now their holes are so big. So if you stick just a pinky in your ear, so all I can get down into my ear canal, I can fit an entire thumb into her ear, which is crazy. They're absolutely ginormous. But to help the sound get there, their face acts like a satellite dish. So they're gonna funnel the sound with their face over to their ears. We kind of do this, like if somebody is gonna tell you a secret, you might do this on your ear. That's gonna help you pick up their quiet whisper sound and bring it to your ear. So it's similar to us. Now, her hearing is one of her superpowers, but her vision is also awesome. That's one of the three things that it takes to be a raptor, right? Was your vision, your beak, and your talents. Yeah, I don't know what's over there that she's <laughs> concerned about. But her vision is awesome too. So her eyeballs are absolutely ginormous. If I were to look inside that ear, I could actually see the back of her eyeballs. So that's how big both her ears and her eyes are compared to her pretty small um, skull. So her eyes, there you go, are so big that they're actually stuck forward. So when we think about an owl turning its head all the way around, they can't go a full circle, although we think they do because they go so fast. But I like to think about a circle as a pizza. We measure circles in 300 or in degrees. A circle is 360 degrees. If I thought about that like a pizza and I took a big slice out of the top, my circle might be close to 270 degrees. That's how far owls can turn their head. They have to do that because their eyes are stuck. So if you hold your chin, you can move just your eyeballs back and forth and not your head. She can't do that. So if she wants to look over here, she has to turn her whole head and not just her eyeballs. <laughs> She's very concerned about what's in our office here. <laughs> so she has that good vision, which is one of our traits to be a raptor. She kind of has um, that beak. It can be harder to see because she has quite the fluffy face. Oh, we'll see if she'll show you. There you go. Kind of see her curved beak there. And she does have pretty big talons. So owl feet look different than both our peregrine and our hawk feet. Our peregrine had those long, skinny, delicate toes meant for dexterity. Our hawk had um, those scaly, big, chunky feet meant for landing on prey on the ground. She has pretty big, chunky feet, but feathers going all the way down act like winter boots. So it helps her in the winter keep her feet warm. She also is sitting a little bit different. So you'll notice she has two talons like this and two talons in the back. Our hawk was sitting three in one and our peregrine was sitting three in one. Owls are what we call zygodactyl. It's a fancy word that starts with an X and they can turn that little toe back and forth to either side, which makes them pretty good at perching. So our owl here is gonna eat mostly cute and fuzzy stuff like mice and voles and things like that. But barred owls also are known to eat things like frogs, toads, and crayfish. Um, I've seen quite a few videos of them eating crayfish and it is pretty impressive to watch. So when they're found in places down south, like in Louisiana where there is no um, dry land and the big cypress swamps, they can still survive there. So owls, when you're looking at them too, are very um, fluffy. Their feather structure is a little bit different than both the birds that we saw previously. Owls don't need to soar in that big strong wind or fly super fast like our peregrine their main concern is being really, really quiet. So things that they like to eat, like mice and voles, also have really big ears. So the mice are good at hearing because they're kind of like the chicken nuggets of the animal world. Lots of things like to eat mice, so they better be good at hearing their predators coming. Our owl here is fluffy not just to make her cute, but to make her really quiet. So a really stiff feather, like that of an eagle, makes a lot of noise when they flap. They're not really trying to sneak up on too much, but our owl feathers here being super soft and really fluffy, that's what makes them really quiet. I've had them fly over my head in the woods before and not even known they're there unless you see them because you don't hear them at all, which is very impressive. And it's my favorite superpower that they have. Yeah, Sarah, I saw your question about how long their legs are. They have super long legs, so I'm not going to show you on her. She has um, this kind of little feather skirt here, and they don't really um, enjoy being touched. 
So I'm not going to lift it up and show you, but they do probably go, you know, um, up here-ish. So I encourage you as a class to maybe uh, look up after this presentation an owl skeleton or owl legs. Um, they're very long and their body is actually shaped a little bit different than what we perceive um, because they are so fluffy. So the first time I saw an owl skeleton, it's like, huh, I didn't really realize they were shaped quite like that. <laughs> it looks a little different than um, what I thought. So this owl, just like our other owls, was a wild owl. Um, she was found as a young bird on the ground, and somebody brought her to the Raptor Center. Um, they checked her over, put her into rehab, where they realized she was blind in one eye. So she's actually blind in the eye closest to me, similar to our hawk. Um, so that's why she was deemed non-releasable. So she's actually really young. This is only her second summer of doing programming, and so she's in her second year of life. And she's pretty big. So a lot of times when I say that, people are like, well, yeah, but she's full grown. Most animals aren't quite like us. They get to their adult size a lot earlier in life than humans do, and then spend most of their life in their adult size. Um, so she might fluctuate a little bit, but she's pretty close to what she's going to be um, for the rest of her life. So I was going to see if she'll show you, since she's so concerned about looking that way. If I can turn her, you can see just how far her head goes. <laughs> so these owls you can kind of see when you look at their back like that they're really good at camouflage owls are amazing at blending in, even in the middle of the day so she would blend into the bark of all those hardwood trees um, that have more of the rough bark like that she blend in really well things like gray horned owls are really good at blending in with pine trees that have that little bit of red tinge so they're awesome at camouflage um, and hard to see. I miss them all the time in the middle of the day, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. All right, I'm going to give you one more look at our elephant here, see if I can get her to look back this way. There you go. Our camera here doesn't like our owl face. <laughs> She's just getting slightly uncomfortable. You can see um, bird body language. She's shifting on her perch a little bit. She's telling me that she may be ready for a break. So I'm going to go put her in her crate. Um, yeah, I'll be right back. I saved time at the end here to answer questions that you all may have. Um, does anybody have any questions or would like to share your screen as a class to ask? So we did give, I don't know if any of you are doing the worksheets for today, um, but there was a couple questions about what type of habitat hawks like. So we, we're talking about them liking prairies and open areas like our agricultural fields. Um, we see them soaring with their big, broad, fan-like wings. One superpower of an owl, I give you too many. They're like one of my favorite favorites are owls. <laughs> um, and then the three raptors we saw today, just to remind you, a peregrine falcon. So he's got those stripes here, his dainty long fingers. Um, a red-tailed hawk has big, broad wings, chunky feet, and that red tail. And then we saw a barred owl. She's got bar stripes on her belly and fur, or feathers, excuse me, feathers all the way down to her talons. Ooh, uh, somebody asked what was the most unique animal that I have rescued. Um, so we don't do as much rehab here at Carpenter. Sometimes we assist with rescues and then get the animals to their appropriate place like the Raptor Center or Wildlife Rehab um, in Minnesota. But I have rescued a goose before, which doesn't sound that crazy, but <laughs> goose have super long neck. So when you're holding, you know, the body of a goose that can't fly, they have quite the long danger noodle pretty close to your face. So that was pretty interesting. And um, one of the first rescues that I ever went on. How many different types of raptors are there in the River Valley? 
I was trying to look up the specific number. I don't actually know. There's quite a few. So we have a, a broad mix of eagles, osprey, owls, hawks, falcons. Like we have a big mix of raptors here in Minnesota and Wisconsin, especially in the River Valley here. Places like the St. Croix and the Mississippi River act like highways for birds. So when they're migrating north and south, um, we call them flyways. It's a big landmark that they can see from up in the air and a good way to follow. So a lot of times in the spring and the fall, you'll see um, nature centers and other places like that do hawk watch or hawk counts. Um, and they're just counting all the birds that are migrating through. So we have a lot of different species. Worldwide though, there are 482 species of raptors. So there's a lot and they vary widely from tiny little things to big, huge eagles that are way bigger than even our bald eagles here. Um, let's see, sorry, I'm just looking at other questions here. Oh, what happened to the falcon? I'm sorry, did I not tell you that one? So he um, was found by somebody that was trying to do the best that they could for them, but instead of bringing him to a hospital, they tried to take care of them on their own. Now, even though I work with our birds here almost every day, I still am not a bird vet, right? I'm not a bird doctor. So instead of bringing him to the bird doctor right away, they kept him at home for a while. When he had fallen out, he had broken his arm and it fused together like this. So it kind of be like somebody coming and taping your arm like this and you could never put it down. So by the time he did get some help that he needed, we couldn't fix it anymore. And so it's just permanently stuck like this. So that little kind of patch that you saw without feathers is what would be similar to our elbow here. So that's why he can't fly. Oh, how much does the owl weigh? So she weighs right now right about 900 grams. She's actually fairly close to the hawk. So she fluctuates right around two pounds-ish, which is not super heavy. Baby owls, I'm not sure exactly how much a little baby owl weighs, but it's not very much. Like, we measure baby birds a lot of times by grams. So even our owl here, that I said 900 grams. So baby birds are tiny, tiny, and very light. So what are some other types of owls that live in St. Croix River? So I mentioned our barred owl. We have those sawit owls that I mentioned, which are just these tiny little things like this. They're so cute. We have great horned owls. Um, what are the owls? That's for sure in the river valley. Up north in Minnesota, we it'll change a little bit, um, a little, slightly different habitat. In the winter, we do get snowy owls down here um, in the river valley, and those are pretty cool. So snowy owls, like what you think of when you think of Harry Potter's all white owl, that's a snowy owl. So they actually live most of the year up in the tundra, um, but in the winter, they'll come down and uh, we have a little bit more readily available food. So they met, uh, blend in in all of our cornfields when there's not much, no trees or anything like that, just kind of snow on the ground. They blend in pretty well. So we have quite a few owls. Good question, Bentley. What's the largest raptor I have rescued? So like I said, we don't do a lot of rescue um, as staff here at Carpenter. I have helped with um, a peregrine falcon on the Prescott Bridge. So we got a call from um, actually the crew that works the railroad portion of the bridge there. And one of the young ones had, was kind of learning how to fly from the nest there on the bridge and didn't quite make it. So we went and picked him up, but they're pretty small. So nothing too big on the raptor side. Um, a lot of my coworkers have helped rescue eagles and stuff like that. So it is pretty impressive to see. They're very big birds, but you have to be careful of those um, sharp talons. So usually when people rescue, they have big, long leather gloves all the way up to here to help protect them from those talons. How many owls do we have at our center? So she is actually our only owl. If you've been out here before, um, a couple of years ago, we had a great horned owl, uh, but she's no longer with us. So now we just have our barred owl. So we have our barred owl we saw today, our red-tailed hawk, our peregrine. Then we also have a bald eagle. You can see him in our visitor center here. And then recently we added a common raven. So she's not a raptor, but she is my favorite bird. Don't tell the other ones. <laughs> They're very, very smart ravens are. And you can um, see her as well. Her name's Corky when you come to the center. So one question I get a lot that we didn't say, um, all three of the birds that you saw today, I didn't call them by a name. So we tend to not name our birds um, because we don't have a lot of them. 
we don't have more than one eagle or more than one hawk. So for us, it's just a good reminder that they're not our pets. Um, I don't get to bring the fluffy owl home with me and hang out with her and my dog. Um, she stays here at the center. They're wild animals that we just get the pleasure of taking care of and showcasing them to awesome people like you. So we tend not to name ours. Does Carpenter still do raptor release? Yes. Um, the last couple of years have been weird for everybody, obviously, but it's on our plans for the fall. So I'm hoping. Usually it's in September every year. So it should, should be happening this fall, but don't want to jinx anything. So knock on wood if you have some. <laughs> so we still do raptor release. Also, if you ever come down to the center, there are a lot of just random days where an eagle is ready to be released that the Raptor Center has just randomly. And a lot of times they will come here to release them um, just because of our proximity to the, the river and all the good land that we have under protection here at the Nature Center. So there might be an off chance too, just on a walk that you get to see an eagle being released. You guys have some awesome questions, nice job. Hey Abby, I'm just kind of curious, does uh, Carpenter, uh, Carpenter Nature Center have owl prowl hikes? Yeah, we do. So that's one of the things I'm usually there in like more fall, winter and um, we come out, usually it's at night, right? In the dark and we listen for owls. So a lot of times we can play an audio lure, it's called. So we'll just play a couple rounds of a call and we'll see if we get any responses. So a lot of times owls call back and forth to each other in the woods. So that is something that you can do here at the Nature Center, our owl prowls. Um, we do them at both campuses. So if you're closer to the Hudson one, uh, definitely watch out for those. And those are an awesome one. In the winter, sometimes we even do them on snowshoes. So it can be super fun. Nice. Well, I guess if there's there's no other questions, uh, Abby, this has been a wonderful program. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks for yeah, especially to, you know, uh, get reminders about the different raptor species that we have around here and in the St. Croix Valley. Uh, and uh, thank you to you as well as the, your guests that came in, that flew in. <laughs> so, yeah, <thank> <laughs> they did a good job today. They've been um, working hard this week, so <laughs> they did good. Yeah, for sure. Well, hey, I, um, I want to thank you, Abby, and thank you, uh, Car uh, Carpenter Nature Center, uh, for your presentation this morning, um, or this afternoon, excuse me. And uh, I guess I'd you know, like to uh, take just a few um, minutes to all of you, the audience here, for joining us today for the 2022 St. Croix Youth Summit. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, this presentation and all the others will be shared on the coming week on the Wild Rivers Conservancy YouTube ch uh, channel account. And the links will be shared with all of you who attended today. Um, uh, you will also be receiving a survey this afternoon. So please take a moment to share both what you've enjoyed and what could be improved on. And then lastly, um, there is a, an event uh, taking place tomorrow. Um, so there is, uh, Encouraging everyone to get outside uh, tomorrow to participate in the Schoolyard Biological Diversity Investigation. Uh, this opportunity is open to students of all ages to get outside and learn who inhabits your schoolyard. Uh, when you participate and submit your data, your school will be added to our online watershed map. And so I threw in some information there in the chat uh, with the... Uh, Oop, there it is. <laughs> I threw some information in the chat there along with the URL uh, web address so you can learn more about this field day uh, experience. So gosh, uh, again, wonderful program. And uh, if nobody else has any questions. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Happy Earth Day. Get outside, enjoy. Thank you all for joining and your amazing questions. Thank you, Abby.